ask you please to take your seats. We're going to get this session underway straight away so that we don't uh, waste too much of the uh, time uh, just uh, standing around chatting to each other. Why, who said that was necessarily a waste of time? I guess it was me. Anyway, thank you. And, and do uh, feel free to come on up. We're in the, the plenary session room uh, on a breakout uh, activity, which means, of course, that the audience is split among three separate groups. And so come on forward and we can try and get a little intimacy among ourselves here. And uh, of course, I'm looking for a, a couple of uh, my, our colleagues in terms of uh, who's supposed to be on the panel. Where's Tom Flanagan when we need him most? Morning, Frank Dabbs, how you doing? An august author in our presence, nice to see you. Uh, we're gonna start this thing, and uh, I'm sure Professor Flanagan will arrive in due course. He may be a victim of last night's partying, you never know. Well, he's a UFC prop, you know, they're slightly a different breed, so, you know. Hello, uh, we've actually got among uh, our panelists a UFC PhD grad, for heaven's sake. Yeah. And he's an Ontarian. We've also got a, uh, a, a grad from, uh, from Harvard, 2005. Won an award for his dissertation. So uh, let me uh, do introduce your panel uh, and, and your topic. By the way, my name is Thompson MacDonald, and I'm a board member and founder of the Manning Center, and I'm very Honored to be so, and I get to work with Preston pretty regularly, and that's reward uh, in itself. The, uh, the, the members of our panel are uh, distinguished and august, and I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, with the introductions because I'm assuming that you uh, got the cell phone app and you dug into the profiles and bios that are published about them. Uh, but uh, let's start with Ian Brody, who uh, is the UFC. Uh, master's and doctoral grad, and uh, we're, we're proud of him, especially since he's adopted by us from, from Ontario. Uh, he's, uh, of course, best known to this group of, uh, of uh, hardcore political wackos, because let's face it, it's Saturday morning, and it's cold, and it's winter in Ottawa, and you're here, you know, like, that qualifies you, you're hardcore. In any event, the, uh, Ian has uh, been a great assistance to the process of establishing a conservative government in our country, and he and, and literally tens of thousands of others have uh, an ownership stake in, in getting us to this place, and uh, Ian more than most, of course, and he uh, became the, uh, the chief of staff to uh, the prime minister. In fact, I believe he came with him from the OLO, they call the office of the leader of the opposition. So uh, I think it's gonna be most interesting to hear him speak to uh, the question of uh, redefining Canadian conservatism. When I saw the title, and it was just sort of handed to me, said, you be the chair of this thing. And I said, okay, I, mean, I think we've got all of us directors sort of working on stage. And it said, redefining Canadian conservatism. And my, absolute, my first reaction was, well, what's the definition? What, are, what is it we're redefining? Has anybody got one of those? Uh, sort of thing. I doubt that we do, but anyway, we will redefine that which is not defined, and we'll do it for you. Uh, secondly, uh, we have as uh, a member of our pa panel, Andrew Coyne. Andrew Coyne, uh, I haven't met save for a, uh, a telephone conference call in preparation for this matter, uh, but I read everything that, that I get a chance to read. He, I find him thought-provoking, I find him uh, well-informed, just the, the most recent column we, we saw this week was trying to give a, uh, Economics 101 a lecture to the Ontario Premier, and uh, it was about, you know, the real impacts of a low dollar, and I think I got the message that, uh, Mr. Premier, the, the low dollar that you're longing for is what got you into this trouble in the first place. But so I, I find uh, great joy in, uh, in reading uh, his material as it comes to us, and, and I think his perceptions on uh, what should be the new definition of Canadian conservatism are going to uh, intrigue us all. Also, 
uh, on the stage as uh, uh, re we're going now to move into another academic. And uh, Travis Smith is a professor at Concordia, ha has written on just about everything. He reminds me of Dr. Paul, who uh, has uh, dug so deep into his, his field that the, the rest of us will just sort of wonder, what is it? <laughs> But uh, published and honored, uh, and uh, as I say, primarily an academic, I, I think it's fair to say, since he's a professor at Concordia, and uh, I, I too am looking to his, uh, his observations on our topic. And Professor Tom Flanagan is about to enter the room, and uh, he's part of that Calgary group. There he is, look at this. Uh, it's amazing. Welcome, Tom. Tom is a, a professor at U of C and one of Calgary's most distinguished commentators. Uh, and uh, I have no idea what he teaches, if he teaches anything at all, but uh, he's, he's, he, he's one of our guys, you know, and uh, you, you don't live in Calgary and, and, and uh, toil in the uh, conservative vineyard and not be aware of Tom. He uh, was... Uh, early in the day of uh, uh, Stephen Harper's rise to power, was uh, one of his key operatives, and in fact ran one of his elections. And uh, he uh, has written some books that uh, you probably are aware of. Well, and we are, uh, if, if fields as uh, varied as uh, First Nations uh, policy and uh, history, and uh, perhaps with some ideas as to where we really ought to be going and most recently has written a book about uh, how Stephen Harper got where Stephen Harper is. And that's met with critical acclaim as well. And uh, he's uh, just one of us and we're lucky he is. I'm, and since he was late, you know, I, I think I'm gonna finger him to get us started. You know, there has to be consequence. So uh, I, I asked uh, the columnists or the panelists if they just give me one, one little factoid about themselves that might not be in the bio, something that you know, might, they themselves might uh, describe. And uh, Tom shot right back uh, and said, uh, well, I've been uh, employed at the uh, University of Calgary for 44 years. Where else do you find employer loyalty like that? <laughs> Thanks very much. Here's Tom. Thanks. I, I'm sorry I'm late. I, I was just confused. I thought I was on this afternoon. Uh, so I was back in my room packing, and then I said, I'll look at the program. And <laughs> what, you know, what am I missing while I'm packing? Well, you know, I'm missing my own performance. Uh, so I ran back like O.J. Simpson uh, through the airport. So we're asked, we're asked in this panel to talk about uh, where does conservatism go now, now that we're, uh, we're in the age of majority government. So uh, I, won't, I won't say very much about the uh, majority government except to say that I, I'm happy about you know, quite a few of the signals they're sending about things they're going to do, uh, uh, moving towards deficit uh, elimination, uh, perhaps something with OAS. Uh, very happy with what Jason is doing in uh, immigration or attempting to do. Um, smaller thing, but to me still important, repeal of Section 13 of the Canadian Human Rights Act appears to be going forward. So, um, so there's a lot of stuff going on that, uh, that I endorse. And, uh, so I, my attention at the moment is focused more on the provincial level because I think that there are, uh, even if the federal government may be on a better track now, um, there are huge challenges uh, in all the provinces, and I can't presume to speak about all of them, but I just thought I'd, I'd talk maybe a bit about Alberta and British Columbia, where I'm, where I'm in Alberta, where I am involved at the moment with the Wild Rose campaign. And uh, it's kind of ironic, you know, this uh, conference organized uh, by the Manning Center. Uh, so in Alberta, the, the Wild Rose Party is now, uh, attempting to do more or less what the Reform Party attempted to do at the federal level. And in my writings, I have called this invasion from the margin. It's based on a certain game theoretic model of politics with certain assumptions. Um, but uh, if you accept the model, it becomes possible to set up a 
and it would work just as well for the left, a further right or a further left party, draw away the more committed supporters of, a, of an older, more centrist party of the left or right. Basically, you end up eating their lunch and uh, driving them out of business, uh, moving in, taking power. Of course, the long-term irony is you, you eventually become what you, re what you replace, but that's a little, little further down the road. Uh, we've talked about that problem, too. Um, but we're still at the earlier exciting stage. Of, uh, of trying to play that game of invasion from the margin. Um, it's already achieved quite a bit. Uh, you know, politicians are motivated mainly by fear of, of uh, being defeated. Uh, good ideas in themselves don't accomplish much. Uh, they have to have some, some a fear factor behind them. And while Rose has made the government, uh, governing party in Alberta very afraid and uh, it led to a change of leadership in, uh, within the party. Ed Stelmack was pushed out because of this fear factor and uh, uh, they repealed their crazy royalty changes uh, and, and they've done a number of things, at least half measures, but they've tried to deal in their own way with some of the problems that they have created. I don't think it's <coughs> going to be enough for them, but you, know, you, can, you can already see we're having an effect, but we want to go further. We want to become the uh, eventually the, the uh, governing party of Alberta. Uh, and, and things are going pretty well. Um, the unexpected victory of Allison Redford did give their party a bounce in the fall, and there was a time when they were going up and we were going down in the polls. Things looked kind of bleak. But um, that's reversed itself. Uh, last six polls have had Wild Rose around 30 percent, and uh, uh, the governing uh, the, the, the PCs around high 30s, low 40s. I mean, they're still ahead. Uh, I'm not predicting victory, but uh, things are actually looking uh, looking pretty good for us. And that they've had a terrible week in in Alberta. It's just one thing after another, as all the chickens are coming home to roost. Uh, that Redford has not problems that she's inherited, but she's not been able to deal with effectively. And it's um, looks like it's getting to that stage where everything starts to stick, even things that maybe aren't that bad start to stick just because people's perceptions of you change. Now, but in Alberta, we enjoy the luxury of being able to uh, challenge a nominally conservative government without having to be afraid of electing the Liberals or the NDP to power. Um, that's a peculiar Alberta luxury, so we can, we can, we can do this. Uh, the federal level, reform, had to take on the progressive conservatives knowing that it would probably elect a liberal government, which is exactly what happened. So we got 13 years of Chrétien um, as a result of reform, and some old line progressive conservatives have never forgiven Manning and the reformers for doing that to their party. I mean, mostly we all got back together finally, but you know, there still are some people who've never forgiven that. Um, and that was the cost of playing invasion from the margin. Um, now we come to British Columbia, uh, where the same game is being undertaken by uh, parties calling itself the Conservative Party of British Columbia. And here I, I, I find this personally very, uh, well, I guess I'm just glad I don't live in British Columbia and don't have to make this decision. Uh, because um, I've got a lot of friends on both sides of the fight there. you know. Uh, Christy Clark is uh, gearing up to present herself as conservative. Uh, and a lot of you heard her yesterday morning. I like Christy, you know, she's very personable. Uh, I, I, I can't say I truly believe it, but she's, you know, she's projecting. Uh, she's hired a lot of good friends that I used to work with. People used to work for me. <laughs> yeah. Christy Clark, um, Ken Bosenkuhl is working for Christy. Sarah McIntyre, a former student of mine. Uh, uh, Dimitri Panzopoulos, former pollster. Um, and I know uh, Jay and Chuck are endorsing the government there. You know, and these are all good friends, and I respect the position they've taken. And you know, the Manning Center is almost officially sponsoring Christy to come out here and 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 become part of the conservative family. But then I've got a lot of good friends uh, on the other side, too. You know, uh, John Cummins, you know, one of the old reformers, you know, kind of a peculiar duck, but I always liked John. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I mean, you always knew where you stood with John. Um, 
Hamish Marshall managing the campaign. A uh, very, very smart guy, worked in the PMO with Patrick Mutard and the, you know, all the planners in there. Uh, so, you know, I've got a lot of friends on both sides of that fight. Unfortunately, I live in Alberta. I don't have to take sides. I, I'm not sure what I would do. I can tell you, talking to people in the audience, um, there's a lot of sympathy uh, among the, you might call it the grassroots of conservatism, there's a lot of sympathy for John Cummins and the Conservative Party of BC even though sort of at the higher official level, everybody's uh, endorsing the liberals, and I understand why they're endorsing the liberals. So anyway, it's, it's very much like the early days of uh, the reform movement when the larger conservative family was, was very deeply split. Uh, so these same kinds of splits are now taking place in Alberta and British Columbia, but the stakes are much higher in British Columbia because you've got this kind of Stalinist guy out there <laughs> as head of the NDP. And so I'm, I'm just glad I live in Alberta, uh, or I can concentrate on renewing the conservative spirit in the province without having to worry about uh, the consequences of uh, electing a, a, an insane government of the left. Um, so anyway, that's a bit of a, uh, a report from the Western provinces. But the larger point I want to make is that the conservative movement has for, you know, for better or worse, we have temporarily triumphed at the federal level, and we're going to do whatever we're going to do at the federal level. Provincial level, you know, much more in need of conservative political action at the moment. I've touched on the two western provinces, but I mean, you know, here we are in Ontario, uh, Quebec, what can I say? We're going to hear something about Quebec in the afternoon. So I, I just think the provincial level is a really important one for the, you know, foreseeable future. And... Um, it's just, as I say, kind of interesting that we are now repeating some of the some of the uh, problems of playing invasion from the margin that we saw in uh, in in those early years of reform. Uh, a bit of an inconclusive uh, talk. I end up by saying I'm not really sure about it, <laughs> except that I can see it all happening again. Okay. Um, Thank you, boss. Well, as usual, uh, Tom's being a, a bit uh, modest. Uh, he's going to be uh, the man who oversees the process of bringing a true conservative government to office in Alberta in just about seven weeks from now. So we'll, uh, we'll remember you saw him here and you heard it here first. Travis Smith is the professor I uh, more fully uh, introduced a few minutes ago. and. Uh, as I mentioned to you, I asked the, the speakers if they had uh, to share with me just a little something that would perhaps get you l more familiar with who they are, like, really, in their lives. Uh, this, this is just plain cute. Uh, Travis wrote, I am embroiled in a storied and controversial rivalry with my 42-pound and 5-year-old son, Alexis, the awesome guy. I am currently the reigning undisputed and now three-time heavyweight, anyweight champion of the Bedtime Wrestling Federation. <laughs> Travis. Thank you, Thompson. If you're wondering where my championship belt is, that's my nickname for the 20 pounds I've put on since I went on sabbatical this year. So, there's something funny in being asked to redefine all of conservatism in Canada in about 10 minutes. Conservative thought being so nuanced and varied and defying ideological unity, it doesn't lend itself to sloganeering. So I'm going to focus my brief remarks today on one subject that already proved a common theme yesterday, that is, generosity. One may dispute whether it is the greatest priority, but it is a necessary component of any conservative vision for Canada's future that would hope to enjoy good prospects. Now, as a professor of political theory, I am going to put my remarks in some theoretical context and hope that I don't seem too absent-minded. In preparation for this conference, I reviewed the Manning Center's barometer from last year, and one thing really grabbed my attention as odd. In what was labeled value statement number 12, the pollsters asked respondents whether they agree that, quote, we all have a responsibility to look after those less fortunate than ourselves and the disagree position was labeled more conservative. 
But when I read this, I wondered why ever would conservatives choose to embrace this caricature of themselves? Other questions in the survey also gave the impression that people must either regard themselves as wholly responsible for themselves or else suppose that government should be responsible for all of us. And again, I wondered, why would conservatives accept this false choice? Surely we can agree that servitude under a Leviathan state is bad and that the concept of collective responsibility is something of a ruse. But without going all the way to the opposite pole and embracing radical individualism, indeed, as Alexis de Tocqueville explained in, uh, in the 19th century, excessive, in, sorry, excessive individualism is a recipe for soft despotism, not for freedom. The question isn't whether or not people who need help should have any recourse, but rather what kind of help is best by way of the state's coercive mechanisms or in civil society through voluntary action. In rejecting the status position, why should conservatives adopt the immoralists' view as their own, saying something like, sorry, pal, that's your problem. I'm through being pushed around by anyone, and from now on, I just look out for number one, and that means me. I can't imagine that conservatives would want to play the role of the big meanies that their opponents like to cast them in. It's possible that a pervasive state-oriented attitude toward public assistance drives those who are allergic to the slightest hint of collectivism all the way in the other direction, losing sight of the essential goodness and necessity of generosity as a virtue. If I may subvert Karl Marx's observation that wage labor snuffs out creative self-expression, well, resentment against what is perceived as excessive mandatory giving may well sour people on voluntary giving. In order to understand the justifications of the welfare state, I suggest revisiting the works of that notorious Renaissance Florentine Niccolò Machiavelli. In laying the foundations for the reorganization of political life, Machiavelli attempted to redefine each of the virtues, and in his handling of liberality, the virtue of giving, Machiavelli noted that princes who are actually generous impoverish themselves. But a reputation for liberality is a good thing for a prince to have. So Machiavelli recommended finding ways to acquire other people's wealth to spend. In so doing, a prince can get a reputation for being generous without it ever actually costing him. Traditionally, a king's treasury was literally his own wealth, spent in his own name. Contrast this with modern representative government, as theorized by Machiavelli's pupil, Thomas Hobbes, in which legislators can spend from the public purse without incurring personal expense. A candidate vying for office can earn a reputation for being generous and compassionate, promising to be their brother's keeper. And those who vote for a Machiavellian operator of this sort will then esteem themselves righteous for being the authors of their candidate's generosity, even when they stand to benefit from his or her promises. Non -liberals, liberals and non-liberals alike may then feel themselves alleviated of the impulse to help others personally and directly. After all, they've paid their fair share of taxes, maybe more, to entrust government with saving them the trouble. Without developing the habits of giving, however, people will lack the good judgment that comes with the experience of giving, needed to discern when gifts are wasted or when well-intentioned help actually harms. But modern democratic people are uncomfortable with such judgmentalism anyway. Indeed, it is not merely incidental that following Machiavelli's recommendations has an effect on people's internal character. That's half the point. Hobbes made this explicit when he rendered Machiavellian precepts as moral principles in his political science. Hobbes envisioned a society in which every individual will be personally dependent on the state, their eyes and ears fixed on what it tells them to say and do. Private association should be distrusted and discouraged. Personal qualities like generosity, gratitude, courage, and independent thought are best neglected and frowned upon. And people should be permitted to be, should be people should be permitted regulated license to do what they please with respect to the lowest and simplest pleasures, while the free exercise of their highest faculties is deemed vain and dangerous. Culting in people a fear of insecurity and aversion to risk, they will look to the state to enable, supply, monitor, and safeguard their pleasures and cure their pains. Now, without even raising the question of how successful or, or efficient institutions of public assistance are in fact, I do not see why people who follow Machiavelli's advice should get away with claiming the moral high ground. But at least, they're not altogether bad. Indeed, Machiavelli would be disappointed in modern liberals for being insufficiently Machiavellian. He anticipated that liberal spending, were it too lavish, they'd have no choice but to be rigorous with taxes, and this would make them hateful. And when they eventually have to impose austerity measures, they would become even more hateful still. So Machiavelli generally recommends being stingy, holding back some of what you could give, and imposing extra restrictions and costs on people so that when these burdens are slightly lightened and more help is given, the people are grateful for it. 
Leading people to believe, however, that they deserve to be given lots and lots as a matter of entitlement only guarantees their ingratitude and proves ultimately unsustainable. Now, Machiavelli does indicate that certain people of ambition do benefit from a reputation for great liberality, namely those who are on the road to becoming princes like Caesar. Now, in a representative system of government like we enjoy, our candidates are always in the position of trying to become or remain little Caesars. And so the system is decidedly tilted in the direction of an ongoing overuse of Machiavellian liberality. No wonder then that instead of expecting the public sector to come to the aid of civil society whenever it falls short, many people now think that the state should and can accomplish pretty much anything we desire of it and what remains of civil society can provide temporary stop gaps or bonus top ups. The defense of generosity that I would make here against Machiavellian liberality is not strictly speaking say, Aristotelian. Aristotle would not defend generosity or any of the virtues simply on account of their being useful or pleasurable. Virtues are rightly praised because they are noble, but that is a little too lofty for us Democrats. It's enough for us to recognize that in addition to being part of a life well lived, generosity remains necessary among human beings because we are not self-sufficient creatures. Related to that point, I want to briefly contrast Machiavellian liberality with Christian charity before recommending greater generosity for lesser reasons. Some churches in the West, especially those whose clergy have largely converted to Marxism and postmodernism, conflate love with social justice. It is, if, it is as if they believe that higher tax rates and greater social spending constitute works of love. Without going into how throwing in with the state like this is in effect sleeping with the enemy, I mean, sure, scripture does say to render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar, but not because Caesar is just so very awesome at what he does. In fact, I seem to recall that the agents of Caesar are usually portrayed as bad guys in the old book. It is because money is not the one thing needful. It is unclear to me how it is charitable on Christian grounds to advocate policies the effect of which are to multiply covetousness, breed resentment, make an idol of an earthly sovereign, and focus man's attention on the bread of this world alone. Progressivist believers who hope to fix the world through social and economic policy in effect aim at proving scripture wrong when it says that, the poor, that of the poor, we shall always have them with us, but mainly because they cannot condone its corollary that the rich we shall always have with us too. Now, in a democratic setting, admitting the, fit that po admitting the fact that poverty is in ineradicable should summon forth a prudent defense of greater, gener sorry, greater generosity. The poor and otherwise less fortunate will always need some help and often they will ask for it and when it is unavailable, they may well demand it. And in our kind of society, that means using democratic mechanisms and sentiments to their perceived advantage. And leaders will arise claiming to represent them. Well, we know it's romantic to suppose that uh, it's possible to build a rational state that will successfully engineer egalitarian justice for all forever and ever through ambitious policies and powerful state institutions without reference to people's character. We know that. Likewise, likewise, however, it is romantic to suppose that drastic measures imposed rapidly, consistent with a rigorous ideology to cut taxes and cut spending, will succeed in rendering those people who have neither learned well to take care of themselves or others to be spontaneously capable and willing to do so. It is one thing for conservatives to, infer, to affirm as a matter of ideological certitude that it is better if people take responsibility for themselves and others around them without immediate and constant recourse to the state, but the repeated assertion of this conviction is insufficient to convince those who have become smitten with the assurances and perceived benefits of massive public spending and expansive social programs such that they would stop clamoring for them, especially when they flatter themselves as morally superior for supporting them. It falls to conservatives to take the lead and set the right example by working as individuals and members of voluntary associations, local communities, charities, religious organizations, and so on, motivating others to join in too so that more people might be persuaded of their claim that people in need of help are better served by efforts made within civil society rather than through the bureaucratic behemoth. The long-term fundamental problem is ethical, not economical or institutional. Government can find ways to disincentivize dependence on centralized power, but to say that government should re-incentivize personal and interpersonal responsibility is somewhat imprecise. It makes the government seem too much like the principal active agent. I guess you could say that government could find ways to de-disincentivize generosity, but I admit de-disincentivize is kind of an ugly term and doesn't make a good bumper sticker. 
But you know the environmental slogan that goes something like act locally and think globally? Well, I submit we should act locally and think locally. But the Manning Center's polling data, data shows that the younger generation is even more gung-ho about bold transformative change at the national or international level in order to bring about equality of results. That's somewhat disheartening. It may just be youthful experience and exuberance, but a lot of it derives from the nonsensical notion of being a citizen of the world that they've been inculcated with. With their imaginations trained on the global plane, it is no wonder that younger Canadians either feel like the only option is what they call systemic change. A lovely euphemism, that. Or else they feel helpless about the ability of one person to do any good, and they underestimate how much power ordinary people have in taking responsibility for shaping their own lives and having some positive impact on the lives of others. Real ethical change is mundane, cumulative, and built on real experiences gained by acting responsibly and personally in concert with others. Conservatives must continue finding ways to draw attention to what people can accomplish together for each other without the need for federal and provincial logos emblazoned on everything. But there are reasons to be hopeful. Returning to value statement number 12, while the chart claims that not caring for the less fortunate is more conservative, when you look at the data more closely, only one in five of those who self-identify as conservative actually say that they hold this supposedly more conservative position. Well, that said, unless and until civil society is revitalized and this stated willingness to be generous is realized and recognized, I suspect that a conservative party may continue to win elections, but it will have difficulty gaining and maintaining approval for governing in a, cons in a discernibly conservative fashion. More people will want that only if their experience convinces them that it genuinely makes their lives and the lives of others better. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very, very much, Travis. The, uh, it's amazing that some simple common sense stuff like that can come from a graduate of the same school as Barack Obama. Oh, I, it's amazing. Speaking of, uh, of how good a job schools do on uh, students, I mentioned earlier in my introduction of Mr. Brody that he's a U of C uh, doctoral grad. And U of C is kind of an interesting spot in, in the world of academia. First of all, it's a really big operation. There's about 35,000 students and uh, they got thousands of professors and a handful of them are actually known as conservatives. They actually stand up and say, we're conservatives. So they. I see Barry Cooper's here, he invented the damn thing. And they, they come out and they claim themselves to be the Calgary School and six guys out of a couple of thousand are the, the image of the school. Fabulous work, great PR, write a book. Uh, Ian is on the panel because uh, his wife is the principal organizer of, uh, <laughs> of, of this uh, function. <laughs> Uh, the other chief cook uh, and bottle washer of this function, by the way, is Don Todd, who, uh, who's also in the room today. That's right. That's why Ian's here. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no doubt. <laughs> so I, I asked Ian, of course, you know, t tell me something about you know, what you are. You know, just give me a little factoid how you, know, you could see into the window of your soul. And uh, he shot back at the moment. Uh, and uh, consider this, Barry. You guys uh, gave him the doctorate. He says, at the moment... I'm trying to master the late 90s video game, Zoo Tycoon. Well, thank you for that uh, introduction, uh, Thompson. Of course, the whole reason I ever ended up in Ottawa in the first place is uh, that my wife is good at event planning, so it's only fair that I end up back here uh, in Ottawa again today because my wife's such a good event planner. Um, <coughs> Uh, I'm happy to be back uh, in uh, Ottawa. I'd heard that it was a mild winter, uh, but I got in on the plane last night from Washington where it was over 60 degrees and sunny yesterday afternoon, and I have to say it's uh, even nicer to be in Washington this uh, particular winter. Uh, in the seven winters that I spent here in uh, Ottawa uh, working on political staff, most of those winters were actually tolerable, except for the two winters when John Baird was the environment minister. Uh, <laughs> Controlling the weather is, of course, the environment minister's responsibility under the Kyoto Accord. <laughs> and I have to say, I love Baird, and I love everything he's done for Canada. 
But I thought that uh, having Ottawa, uh, the Ottawa Regional Minister at Environment, he could have turned the heat up a little bit. Ottawa winters were a lot better when Rana Ambrose was the Minister of Environment. And I applaud the work that I hear Peter Kent is doing in keeping Ottawa warm this particular winter, except for last night. Um, when we talk about uh, redefining Canadian conservatism, I don't think there's anything fundamental uh, about uh, principles of conservatism that particularly need redefining. But I do think the problems that we're going to face over the next, or the challenges we're going to face over the next, let's say, five years, are different from the ones we faced in the era of what I like to talk about as Canada's new government era of uh, Canadian conservatism, or the Stand Up for Canada era of Canadian conservatism that I was involved in six years ago now. And that means the face that we're going to show uh, Canadians and the world uh, is changing and will continue to change. I'm not going to go into the reasons why the economic situation is different now than it was uh, six years ago. The panel this morning uh, had uh, all the economic uh, heavy hitters of the government and of the think tank world. So I'm not going to uh, uh, go into uh, uh, repeating any of those details, except that I think actually <coughs> the world economic situation is quite a bit worse than Canadians uh, I think have fully absorbed uh, Canada's relative isolation from the implications of the crisis in 2008 uh, has made everybody much more optimistic in Canada than any place else, which is great, uh, but eventually the world economic situation will catch up with everybody and the adjustment is coming. Back in 2005, when we set out to plan what became Canada's new government, uh, I think we were conservatives of the energetic government variety, uh, not libertarians, but builders. Uh, we were conservatives with a respect for federalism uh, to refocus Ottawa on areas of core federal responsibility. We were conservatives in the patriotic sense of the term, uh, not nationalists of the Trudeau era, but planning a refurbishment over time of the traditional patriotic symbols, but updated for a modern era. We were influenced, of course, by John Howard's formula for success, Howard put it as social conservatism married to economic liberalism. I, I gather that means something different in Australian than it does in Canadian, but you get the impression. And we were focused, I think, on where conservatives should always be focused, on the lives and concerns of the broad middle class uh, families of, the, of uh, any great uh, democratic system, including Canada. Every great democracy is uh, built on the broad swath of uh, middle class economics, middle class uh, families, middle class uh, uh, political and personal morality, and especially the c solid core of blue collar families. So the governing agenda that we put together was designed with these considerations in mind. Stopping the plan, as you'll recall at the time, for national government run union staff child care program uh, and delivering money instead straight to parents. If we did nothing else in the time that I was in Canada's new government, stopping that was an advantage for Canadian conservatism, for which I think the Prime Minister deserves credit, obviously. <laughs> stopping the plan for vast uh, federal spending on government-selected green energy programs and delivering tax credits instead straight to public transit commuters, which I think is in the same vein, uh, a substantial contribution to Canadian uh, public policy. Rebuilding the Canadian forces, but with a priority on the defense of Canada, especially in the north. A big program of criminal justice reform, big tax cuts starting with the GST cut, big investments in infrastructure, and so on. Some of that was held up, of course, in the minority government years. Uh, when we drafted Stand Up for Canada as an election plan, it was with the idea that we would win a majority in that election campaign, and that didn't turn out quite so the way we had expected. But I think that by probably the end of this year, early next year, most of that agenda will have been accomplished. It was, of course, an expensive agenda. Federal spending is up, and not just because of the temporary federal stimulus package. Under the 1867 Constitution, the federal government is responsible for expensive things, and there's not much you can do about that. If you're going to focus on federal jurisdiction, there are some expensive things that need doing. Politically, it all worked when the economy was booming. We shifted a great deal of spending to middle-class families directly and lifted a tax burden off of families with children, commuters, tradesmen, and seniors. These folks all got a tangible benefit from having Canada's new government in office, and the political success of that shows. Stephen Harper is the only prime minister since the end of the Second World War to see his share, or his party's share, of the popular go vote go up in every single election he has contested. That's never happened. 
Now things are changing, of course. We won't have the same fiscal room that we had in 2006, so the big signature tax cuts, I guess, are off the agenda for the time being, not workable for the time being, without substantial uh, cutback on the spending side. And funneling major new benefits to middle-class families isn't workable either for the time being. The equation that we try to establish in this regard, therefore, is not going to be a reliable equation for the next three or four or five, six years. And that, in fact, is going to drive the redefinition of conservatism, at least here, and will drive, by the way, the def redefinition of conservatism in other countries as well, has already done that, and to a certain extent, Canada's just catching up. There are two central political challenges here, to my mind. One is to shrink government spending by targeting sacred cows that don't touch middle-class families first, and to do so in a way that uh, makes it look like we're overdoing it, if anything else. There's a lot of government spending that appeals to fairly narrow and elite segments of society, and axing that spending is going to fill the airwaves with howls of outrage for months and months and months and months. That's what's coming. Before we touch anything that actually delivers benefits to middle-class Canadians, we have to show serious, deep cuts to everything else. In that sense, the howls of outrage are an advantage. A sign of success, I hope. The second challenge is actually going to be more difficult. If we're going to start tackling the more fundamental changes in Canadian economic policy, we have to keep our mind on connecting with actual Canadians and actual voters and actual citizens. <laughs> it's good to know there's one populist left in the room. <laughs> <coughs> The trap, or the potential trap, is to uh, be talking past voters or talking over the heads of voters to the economic policy wonks in the room, with all due respect to the folks in the previous panel. We can get caught up, and we could get well get caught up in the trap that the last government did of yapping on insensibly about innovation, productivity, and competitiveness, concepts that don't really mean anything to most voters. There's no, no uh, surprise that people feel disengaged from politics and there's declining participation or declining voter turnout in an era when all of the major parties are talking about concepts that have very little relation to people's lives. I remember a focus group we did early on in the Canada's new government era. There was a young mother in the focus group with two small kids at home who held down a part-time job to contribute to the party, to the um, uh, family finances. How she ended up being recruited, how she, we ended up getting her to the focus group is a bit beyond me, actually. I congratulated Patrick on uh, persuading her even to come. When the focus group leader asked her to talk about Stephen Harper, she said Stephen Harper was the only politician in her lifetime she had ever been able to watch on television and understand exactly what he was saying. I thought that was a huge success, and I tried to keep that in mind, is that if we're not speaking to people uh, uh, about issues that are of relevance to them and speaking in terms that are accessible to people, we've failed. And that's going to be a challenge as the government moves to take on more thoroughgoing economic reform issues. And then I just want to uh, uh, conclude by uh, uh, seconding Tom uh, Flanagan's uh, uh, opening uh, earlier remarks here. <clears throat> These challenges are going to work their way out of the federal level uh, there's going to be a great deal of uh, kerfuffle about the budget that comes up and some of the spending decisions of the next three or four years. Um, and uh, I think the government's in strong shape to deal with that. The dynamic action is going to be at the provincial level. Uh, there's no question in my mind that the future of Canadian conservatism is not going to be determined first and foremost here in Ottawa, but in provincial politics this year in British Columbia and Alberta and in some of the other provinces over the coming years. Uh, this is not that strange. We know what this looks like. Uh, we have a unified Canadian party federally, but we remember well the exciting and dynamic history that got us there federally, the strategic missteps of the Moroni years, the long period of conflict between Joe Clarkism and the rest of Canada's Conservatives, and then the construction of the new Conservative Party. Something similar is going on in Alberta and British Columbia, and Tom's set out, uh, I think, the uh, stakes of that dispute or the stakes of that, uh, those two uh, uh, conflicts quite well. Uh, I'm optimistic that in Alberta you've got enough space to uh, play invasion from the, from the, uh, from the right, uh, and I hope that uh, British Columbia doesn't uh, end up being tripped up uh, by obviously how that game is going to play out differently at the provincial level. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.
Thank you very much. You know, when uh, Stephen Harper ran into this gap of uh, a huge hole in his staff and uh, Ian left, uh, he had to dig rather deep to find a replacement. And I, I'm saying that his, uh, Stephen's current chief of staff was robbed uh, from the board of the Manning Center. Uh, it's Nigel Wright. Perhaps you didn't know that, but just another contribution made by the Manning Center. When I asked Andrew Coyne, tell me a little something about yourself, he didn't reply. <laughs> so it, it left uh, me to sort of make up my own stuff, and I, <laughs> <laughs> I thought about it really deeply. You know, the first one I thought, I said, eh. it was kind of self-deprecating. I said, you know what he's saying? He's saying, listen, that's a trite and tired old hackneyed tactic that chairman quit using back in the 70s. And I had to admit he's kind of right. But uh, then I thought a little deeper and I thought, you know what he's really saying? Do your own damn research, McDonald. And, and so I, it, and I settled on that answer because while it was easy, I read his stuff. I truly do. I'm a fan. I, I just, uh, when, I, when I'm finished reading whatever he's on his mind lately, uh, I feel like I, I own something. There's something in my pocket I can carry around. I need something I know now that I didn't before I read it. And that's how I measure such things as to whether they were a good investment. And, and I can assure you they truly are. So batting cleanup, Andrew Coyne. Uh, well, thank you, Thompson. I, I, I assure you, I meant no such thing by uh, my my in, uh, inexcusable uh, neglect of responding to you. It was just terminal disorganization, I'm afraid. Um, well, we were asked to discuss uh, redefining Canadian conservatism, and the, the the sense I got from the question was that um, you know conservatives have kind of moved from triumph to triumph, and really, what's left for an encore. Uh, you know, what have they left to achieve, and really they're going to have to move the goalposts and, and redefine conservatism to, to, to continue to give themselves a, a mission. Uh, and I guess I'm going to try and address some of that in my remarks, uh, uh, and I'll be addressing these mostly to people who are actually in the conservative party. I know there's always a mixture at these events of people who are small c and large c uh, conservatives. Uh, I'll have to confess off the top, I'm not particularly interested in uh, defining or redefining conservatism as such, because I, I really don't see the point of knowing whether a given idea is or is not conservative, or in asking myself how does a conservative respond to X or Y. It, it's always struck me as kind of an odd way to think about the world, that you start with a box and then try to make your views uh, fit inside it, rather than having a set of views and then maybe you put a label around it after you've finished. What I believe in are a set of principles having to do with the freedom of the individual, the usefulness but not infallibility of markets, and the essential but limited role of the state. It's not about more government or less government as far as I'm concerned, it's about the right amount. There are, to be brief, a few things that we need government to do based on some pretty well-established criteria on which there's actually quite a high degree of expert consensus. If people tell you that economists are always disagreeing, for example, it's not actually true. Most economists agree most of the time on most things. The policy dilemma is how to get government to stick to those things rather than waste scarce resources on things that could be done as well or better by other means. Or as I like to put it, government should only do what only government can do. Well, as I say, these ideas are not particularly novel or even controversial. You'd find some support for them, greater or lesser degree, across the political spectrum. Nevertheless, there was a party once that believed in these things to a somewhat greater extent than the other parties. Uh, that party called itself conservative, whether with a small c or a large c, so I suppose you could call the things it believed in conservatism. But you are no longer that party. For example, that party favored balanced budgets, but you are not that party. In fact, you boast of how your decision to add $150 billion to the national debt saved the economy. Not much evidence it had any such effect, or indeed that the economy, as opposed to saving your government, had anything to do with it. That party favored cutting, or at least controlling, spending after the massive spending spree of the Liberals last years. But you are not that party. In fact, you boast of how you have increased spending by 7% per year 
$37 billion in one year. That party favored a simpler, flatter tax system that left people free to decide how to spend, save, or invest their money for themselves. But you are not that party. In fact, you boast of the many gimmicks and goo-gaws with which you've festooned the tax code for the benefit of whichever interest group or demographic you were chasing at the time. That party favored abolishing corporate welfare. But you are not that party. In fact, you boast of the handouts you make. I get a press release every day. Or you can see these, uh, press, these uh, 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 signing ceremonies accompanied by ministers or indeed MPs bearing outsized novelty checks. In some cases, you even put the conservative logo on them as if it were your money. That party favored privatization, deregulation, reform of public services, do you remember? But you're not that party. Employment insurance, via rail, Canada Post, the CBC, you've really no plan for reform of any of them. Transportation and telecommunications remain as protected and overregulated as, as ever, while your support for supply management in agriculture borders, if I may say, on the hysterical. You even boasted through two elections of how much more intrusive and heavy-handed your environmental policy was compared to the market-oriented measures preferred by your opponents. To be fair, you've not actually nationalized anything, except the auto industry, <laughs> and in a way, Potash Corp. That party was for a robust parliament with more powerful MPs, free of the party whip. Needless to say, you're not that party. That party was for a balanced federation of equal provinces, but you are now the party of asymmetric federalism and nations within nations. That party was against breaking election promises. That party was against patronage and pork barreling. And that party was against corruption and political dirty tricks. I don't know whether you're still that party. This isn't a question of incrementalism, but of going in entirely the wrong direction. It isn't just that you failed to do the things you should have. It's that you did a lot of things you should not have. And what is worse, And what is worse, you did them not reluctantly or shamefacedly, but enthusiastically. You didn't just sell out, you bought in. I don't want to say it's been all bad. You fought the last election on cutting corporate tax rates, and you should have, and you've introduced or promised some other useful tax reforms. Your trade policy is tremendously ambitious, and you've made some tentative, if largely unsuccessful, efforts to untangle the mess the provinces have made of our own domestic market. You've avoided some of the worst mistakes of your predecessors, and I suppose for Stahl and some others, they might have made had they been in your place. We'll never know. And now we are told we're about to see unveiled a breathtaking budget, March the 29th, that will finally begin the turn towards smaller government. That having increased spending by nearly $70 billion since taking office, you might cut as much as $8 billion from it. That the conservatism you largely abandoned over the last eight years can be reconstructed in the course of an afternoon. Good luck with that. You've spent your time in office educating people in what they should expect from government in general and your government in particular. You've established the criteria by which they should judge you as the party that brings home the bacon. They might be forgiven now some distress at finding that their bacon rations have suddenly been shortened. And they will be disinclined to trust you as you begin to tell them some hard truths, since you've been so little disposed to earn their trust until now. Perhaps you will succeed nevertheless. You have your majority after all. But consider that even if you do, in 2016, after 10 years in power, you will be spending more after inflation, adjusting for population growth, than the liberals in the last days of Paul Martin. So before you ask, where is conservative going, perhaps it'd be better to ask, where has it gone? Much of what's left to be done, to recap my original paragraph, is really going to be to undo what you've been doing over the last six years in power. But look, I don't want to overstate this. You're entitled. You're the government. You're entitled to make these choices. I simply want to impress upon you that it is, in fact, a choice that you've made. There's a lot of 
coverage that you read in the media, and indeed feedback you get from conservatives themselves, that each of these decisions that you made about policies, and you could cite dozens of examples if you wanted to, was a matter of sort of really tough kind of going against conservative principles, and this must have been very tough for the party. But after a while, after the 50th or 60th example, you do have to kind of say, well, actually, these are your principles. You are what you do. This is what the choice that you've made. Um, it's, a, it's a choice you're entitled to make, but it's a choice uh, that you're made. That's now what you stand for. Uh, that's what you are now. You are this party. Thank you very much. And, you, and you, I think you call that grist, something to chew on. And thank you very much indeed. Uh, now we're going to move to that segment where we like to hear from you. This is, uh, you own this as well as the rest of us. And uh, I'm happy to say, by the way, that we've uh, left a reasonable amount of time to get a few questions in. Uh, I have rules though, and I, uh, like to uh, directly uh, address those of you who will come and ask a question. This is called a question and answer session. I'll brook no speeches. I'm happy to welcome and direct questions. Got it? Okay. Thank you very much. Carry on. My name is Flora Almeida Marlowe from Muskush, Quebec, which is rural Quebec. And I have met Mr. Ian Brody many, many years ago before Mr. Stephen Harper's name was known in Quebec. And you were doing a good job. And I was impressed with your speech today because uh, I hope you are not invited just because of your wife, but because of your grassroots uh, commitment. I was just impressed with the last speaker because you touched me by speaking the reality of what's going on at, at the moment. At the moment, we, we said conservatism was for honesty, fairness, justice, and family values. And we seem to have forgotten all these points that we consider conservatism and con for, for what we vote for the conservative party. And I feel that the conservative party is going on the wrong track at the moment. And as I Ian, Ian Brody, yes, Ian Brody, Ian Brody, I would like to ask you a question. That if somebody asks your help in regard to when they're not being listened, like because you were on the top, would you give them a hear or would you say, no, this problem does not exist? In regard to discrimination. Would you give them a, you, listen, you would listen to them or would you say that some certain problem does not exist even without looking into the matter? Thank sure. you. Um, I'm not entirely sure that uh, uh, that I understand uh, uh, the the the, uh, uh, the question, but let me try to do what I can to uh, to understand what I I I, uh, I think the question is. Uh, I mean, if it's a question about me uh, uh, per personally. I'm not, you know. I, I help all sorts of people as much as possible, but I don't work in the government anymore. And uh, you know, I don't. Uh, uh, I don't try to keep my fingers in the government. There are people around who are in the government, and there's a pile of MPs here and so forth. And you should probably have a chat with uh, a chat with them. But my impression is that the uh, um, uh, you know the, the, that the government has been very attentive to uh, the sorts of concerns that uh, uh, that you've raised. And uh, if there's uh, if there's some uh, glass that has not yet been filled or properly uh, or properly emptied, uh, we should. We should, we should, of course, keep that in mind. Thank you. Sir. John Mortimer, Vancouver. <clears throat> Wondering if we could get Andrew invited to make that speech at the next Conservative Party convention and maybe a future caucus meeting. I'll, I'll second that and, uh, and perhaps help uh, Mr. Coyne understand that this is not a PC party. <laughs> this is the Manning Foundation. We are the movement, uh, and we are... Uh, challenged and charged to be as critical of the government as anyone else. So uh, 
we'll be happy to see you do that there too. We'll endorse I'll, I'll, it. I'll await the invitation in the mail, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and I, I, I did try to preface this by saying that I understand there's more than just large C conservatives here. I do think whether you're a small C conservative or a large C conservative, and again, you know, this, this is your party, do what you want with it, but it is extraordinary that how little opposition, how little pushback there's been on so much of this thing. I mean, Harper will come along and, you know, in the course of a breakfast meeting, reverse 20 years of policy and Nobody resigns, nobody speaks up, doesn't get any pushback from the grassroots, everyone just kind of goes along with it. And I guess it was, you know, people were so bought into this idea, we gotta get to the holy grail of the, of the majority government, uh, and maybe this will all pay off for them and they'll get the government of their dreams over time, we'll see. But there's been a load of compromise on the road of that horizon. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's extraordinary and, and it, it is baffling when you look at this compared to other countries. In other countries, their politics always has a certain tension to this. A certain, there's a certain boundary to, to the government's freedom of operation. If we do X, there'll be trouble in cabinet, or there'll be trouble with the caucus, or there'll be trouble with the base. And that discussion has basically disappeared in Canada, along with concepts like privatization or deregulation or whatever. It's just, and so basically, all of those kinds of subject matters have kind of been kind of pushed off the map. Nobody talks about them anymore. And they've become kind of beyond the pale because, my God, if even the conservatives, if even the conservatives won't do, won't contemplate X or Y or Z, it must just be ultima thule. Uh, so it's a, it's a very strange period we're in. I think by that very question, you're beginning to see at least the nascent uh, beginnings. Thank you. Ma'am? Well, I was just going to follow up on that. Leah Costello from Vancouver. I had the delightful experience of organizing an event when Mike Walker retired as executive director from the Fraser Institute. Andrew Coyne spoke, and he introduced uh, his speech by apologizing uh, somewhat for being an unreliable conservative, is how he uh, termed it. I would say, Andrew, if you were to be con and part of the Conservative Party, you sound like a very reliable conservative at this point. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, and I'd, I'd like to follow up with the rest of the panel and just get um, your comments on that. I too have felt um, very disgruntled, um, optimistic on some fronts uh, that the Conservatives are going in the right direction in, in some files. I'm particularly a big fan of what we're doing with immigration. But on economic and fiscal responsibility, I really feel like we are not sending the right message and that is creating distrust. And I'd like the rest of the panel to comment on um, why that is, and now that we're a majority, please tell me that you think that this will change. To take the first whack at that. Yeah, is this working? Yeah. Um, it, it's difficult to hear up here, hear what the other speakers are saying, and so that's why I uh, moved down there when Andrew was speaking. I wanted to make sure I could hear the whole flogging. Didn't, uh, didn't want to miss any of it. Um, And I've heard similar things from Andrew before, and, and oh, to be honest, I've said, uh, said a lot of the same things myself to the point that the Prime Minister won't speak to me anymore. Um, but, and, and Ian can, can, can address this as well. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time uh, trying to run campaigns based on the principles that uh, Andrew advocated, and uh, they always lost. Um, the point of a political party is to strive for power. You, you can have influence, and, and, and maybe that's better in some higher scheme of things. Maybe it's better never to win power. Maybe it's better to drive the agenda uh, from outside, but your, your party gets pretty demoralized if, if, if that's all that you ever do because people really, really do want to win. So I, I, I don't really have an answer for this. Um, uh, Andrew's, uh, you know, I read every, everything that Andrew writes, a gifted observer and writer on the political scene, but uh, Andrew is uh, not inside a party. He's, he's not actually doing politics. He's talking about politics. Uh, that's, not, that's not a bad thing. That's a good free market career. Uh, <laughs> and you're the, you're, the, you're the best of that career. Uh, but that's not, the, that's not the career of running a political party and winning power. And uh, I, I kind of hover uncertainly between those careers, uh, not succeeding fully in either one. <laughs> so, you know, I, I agree with everything you say. 
uh, but then I think about the imperatives of winning, and uh, and I understand why the, the party is doing what it has, has done what it has done, even though I openly criticized much of it. Um, I'm, I'm more encouraged now. Uh, I guess I'm willing to uh, uh, to be encouraged by the directions I'm seeing uh, coming out of the party now. Um, but I'm not sure what more I can say. I just I really do not have a final answer on that. Travis, does this uh, move you to respond in any way? Does anything come to mind that you'd like to share? I'm, I'm so formulated. <laughs> we'll come back to it. How's that? Thank you. Uh, Max question just, comes from this way. Can I just very briefly respond to Tom? Is that all right, Thompson? Pardon? Can I just very briefly respond to Tom on, on, on this? Can I just? Yes, oh, certainly. Um, let me stress first of all, I'm in favor of compromise. This is not kind of some purist. You know, if, if, if you'd done all kinds of things that were the, in, on the right direction, then, you, you know, you'd failed to privatize the sidewalks or something, then, yeah, you could accuse me of being a purist. But I don't think that's actually what I'm arguing for. I, I, I understand the necessity of compromise in this world, but compromise is not the only virtue. I do think, I will admit that I do think there's more important things than power. I do think you can have a lot of influence in opposition. We were actually not a badly governed country in the late 90s when the, the Reform Party was in opposition and was pushing the liberals to go further faster uh, on getting to grips with the deficit. That was actually a pretty fruitful era. I mean, it wasn't great if, from a partisan standpoint of if you wanted to be actually pulling the levers, but I'm looking from the standpoint of, of good governance of the country. Um, so yeah, ultimately you can make a choice to say principles are not as important as power. I'm just saying, don't delude yourself. You've made that choice then. And don't try to come sidling along and saying, well, actually, we haven't sold out our principles for power. We've just sold out our principles for power. Uh, at some point, you do have to understand the choices that you're making. Ian. <coughs> Let me try and get back to, I think, Leah's original question here. I'm not going to talk about anything that happened when I was in government because I'm hopelessly interested. I'm not a disinterested observer uh, on this. So let me talk about something that happened when I was not in government. Shortly after I left government, uh, uh, the uh, federal government announced uh, the end to a multi-million dollar uh, program that allowed uh, Canadian uh, arts groups to travel internationally. Uh, it was a perfectly defensible decision. There had been a series of reviews uh, of the uh, program over time. Uh, it was a particularly, not just badly run, but badly designed program, which I assume had been designed to serve somebody's political interests of some sort. Uh, the pay, you know, all the independent evaluators, auditor general reports, internal reports, it had gone through the whole cycle. This is a program that the government should not be involved in. We should cut this, and if we want to do something like this, we should want something else. And so the government made the decision and made the announcement that this program for moving Canadian artists around the world was going to come to an end. Just before there was going to be an election campaign and there was a shitstorm of media commentary about it, especially in Quebec. And I can tell you, there's two dozen people sitting in this room right now who phoned me at the time, assuming that I still had some kind of influence, which I did not at that point, to tell me that had we lost our minds, what the hell is going on here? Why are we cutting this program? We should not cut this sort of thing because it's insulting to Quebec and it's going to end our chances of uh, getting a breakthrough in Quebec and we're gonna pay a price for this and don't you see that all the media commentators hate this and why are we so stupid? I'm not saying that there were a bunch of arts groups phoning me about this. I think the people in the community knew what the program was about and had been through all the evaluations. I'm saying there are people in this room here now, today, 20 of them who called me or emailed me to tell me what a bad idea this was. <laughs> That's the reality of the situation. So let me tell you, if in the course of the next couple of weeks we have a budget that's going to try and cut whatever it's gonna be, $8 billion over five years or some not very ambitious, you know, people keep telling me about, oh, it's an austerity budget, it's an austerity budget, oh, it's an austerity budget. Uh, yeah, I work in the international financial world now. Green the UK is an austerity situation. The United States is going to go through an austerity situation after the next election campaign, or it will be a catastrophe. Canada, this is an adjustment. A few billion here or there is an adjustment. There will be a media shitstorm about whatever's announced in the budget, too. Don't phone 
asking what the hell we've done lost, losing our minds to jump on that bandwagon. Conservatives should phone, should organize, should speak out actively if they want smaller government whenever the federal government cuts something. I don't want to have a National Citizens Coalition radio ad campaign about the government sold out, it's, you know, it's not going far enough. I want the National Citizens Coalition radio ad campaign saying, good for it, do it again next year. $8 billion a year for the next five years, or 10 years or whatever, however long the Harper government's going to have, that's exactly what we want to have. When we cut the GST, I don't want to hear from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, which ran an ad campaign criticizing the GST tax cut. When conservative governments cut taxes, I want to hear conservatives cheering the cutting of taxes. That's my advice. For, okay, I'll offer just a, a few remarks uh, from sort of a longer term perspective. Um, you know, having, having had a conservative party in government for a number of years now, uh, the Canadian public has been able to learn that the prospect of a uh, Conservative Party returning to par uh, government uh, in Parliament was not quite as terrifying as they had been led to believe for the long period prior to that. If you remember, uh, of course it's still used, but I remember in the uh, first couple of elections, uh, whenever I was listening to talk radio or watching the news, uh, one word was being used quite frequently uh, not only by the opponents of the Conservative Party, but of course by the telejournalists. And that was the word uh, radical right-wing agenda. Radical right-wing agenda. Uh, all one word. Um, <laughs> and, and you could tell it had been focus grouped uh, and because they couldn't use the word enough. And you know, I don't know if there ever was such a radical right-wing agenda that they were worried about, but um, I do actually think it was good that uh, the new Conservative Party had experience governing in minority governments uh, instead of having had the false impression that a strong majority government or even a weak majority government might have had the first time out that they had some sort of mandate for radical change because well, that always backfires. And they had to learn instead the practices of parliamentary politics. Uh, but to end, uh, conservatism is bigger than the big C conservative party, but it does of course depend on there being such a party and a successful one. Uh, but I wouldn't pretend to have any insight as to where it's going to go in the short or medium term. Thanks very much. And I, I just want to thank the questioner again. That provoked a thoughtful response up here. It was fun. Sir. Uh, Professor, or sorry, my name is Nick from Toronto. Uh, Professor Flanagan has written some very interesting literature on uh, game theory and specifically on uh, minimum connected winning coalitions and uh, how the party was able to form one in the last election finally. I guess my question is given that uh, apparently the, you know, the budget has to shrink, right? Like the cuts are coming presumably. Uh, what's going to keep the new conservative coalition together and what's going to keep the opposition divided? I mean, what are the prospects of, of maintaining this minimum winning coalition? and what are the prospects, perhaps, that the other parties might form one in time for the next election? Thank you. Do you actually write that, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds pretty sophisticated. Yes. yes. Um, well, that was easy to say. I don't know. It's for the, f the future. Nobody can know the future. Um, I mean, all, all parties attempt to form a minimum connected winning coalition. Some are more successful than others. Um, Conservative Party's minimum connected winning coalition is rather different from, in some ways, from the original plan. The original plan was to try and bring back uh, soft francophone nationalists in Quebec, and that hasn't worked as well as was hoped. Worked a little bit, but you know, not as well as was hoped. And uh, but instead, the um, uh, ethnic voters. Um, have been have been brought in, which wasn't really part of the original plan. Uh, that Mr. Harper got that insight along the way, and that has you know kind of substituted for the original plan. Uh, but basically, what you have now in the, uh, the Conservative Party voting coalition, it's it's mainly a coalition of employed, productive people. Um, 
it's a combination of blue collar and white collar employed people i don't know that the cuts will are going to matter that much to the to these voters i think they will the particular voters are going to be able to ride that out in the longer term the maybe the bigger challenge is the aging of the society as the conservative coalition comes to consist more and more of retired people will the will that the government be able to resist you know excessive pandering to to people my age you know are going to be very expensive already very expensive you know so I see that as kind of a long-term problem but I I don't think that I think Ian is right that the budget cuts that are being contemplated are in the big picture so relatively insignificant they should not destabilize the existing conservative coalition any other observations from panel members okay sir yes, uh, hello my name is Mathieu I'm from Ottawa and my question is very simple to a point that to say especially when we are talking about a conference which is redefining Canadian conservatism do you think that classical liberalism and libertarian could be welcome in this in this new framework I don't think there's any question that, you know, the leader for whom I'm working in Alberta, uh, Danielle Smith, openly defines herself as libertarian. There's, you know, there's all kinds of people who call themselves libertarians who are active uh, in the party. They, they don't win all the fights over policy by any means, but, you know, when you're the leader, you win a lot of these arguments <laughs> over policy. So, so, yeah, I don't think there's any question that they are, I mean, if, if you're a pure anarcho-capitalist, -cap you're not going to be happy in any you know, uh, any political party, you know, if you're sort of an Andrew Coyne caricature, not the real Andrew Coyne. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, a moderate, moderate, uh, moderate libertarians, you know, even Andrew would make a, a good conservative candidate if he just would observe message discipline. <laughs> uh, just to, to reject the caricature, I must once again emphasize, uh, I'm actually a socialist by any historical um, reckoning, uh, I'm a big government person, and I'm to the left of a lot of you on a lot of these issues, on health care, for example. So I describe myself as a liberal, conservative, libertarian socialist, because they've each got something to teach us. Tom Flanagan described himself yesterday as an immigrant member of a trade union. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell uh, the people at the microphones that we're down to time for but one more question, and that will be you, sir. Hey guys, um, I was wondering if uh, you could answer, uh, what do you think about the future or poss possibilities in the future of safeguarding property rights in this country? Well, I mean, it's, it, it, well, I'll start over. Well, I mean, it's, there is some protection. There's common law protection. We haven't put it in the Constitution. Uh, that was thought of being desperately radical, even though it's in the Constitution of all kinds of countries around the world. I think it remains uh, an, a, a worthy goal. Uh, property rights should be part of any uh, sensible countries, you know, in the, in the Western liberal tradition. Uh, I do think um, the, probably the, the best way to go about it is not to sort of go at the, 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 the abstract principle first, but go at the objective consequences when you don't recognize property rights, when property rights are overridden, uh, because all kinds of nasty things follow. Uh, and you have to make it concrete for people so they can see that, so they can see that, that, that you know, so you, you argue from facts, argue from cases, rather than getting too windy and abstract and theoretical, I think is, is fundamentally the way to go on this. And particularly on issues like the environment, for example. Remember, you're always trying to reach people who aren't already in your camp. You don't want to just preach to the choir. Um, and the environment, frankly, is a big missed opportunity for conservatives in general, because there's a whole generation of free market environmentalists who've grown up, who really understand markets, who understand that they're not just avenues for private greed, but are actually social institutions that can be quite usefully harnessed to things. So you've got a whole generation, as I say, who understand the use of price mechanisms, et cetera, to achieve environmental goals. And there was a great opportunity for conservatives there to say, well, if you like what the market can do for you on the environment, now that I've got your attention, uh, can I interest you in what you can do for you in education and healthcare and these other areas where it's been underused? And because conservatives, I think, passed on that opportunity, I think they lost out, lost that opening. But one particular aspect of that, of that is, 
um, a lot of times when you examine cases of environmental degradation, one of the things that's at the root is either the failure to assign property rights, the tragedy of the commons, uh, or uh, property rights are there and they just get roughly overridden because it, you know, the government of the day wants to have jobs for the boys. Uh, so you can make a case to people who would not automatically and, and, and instantly be in your camp, you can reach them through these kinds of arguments. Man, the issue of property rights, uh, an issue uh, uh, dear to my heart. Uh, first of all, I would uh, second uh, everything that uh, Andrew has said about the concrete case for property rights, simply declaiming the abstract case for property rights and discussing the subject in the abstract is a very difficult proposition in the public sphere. Um, in the private sphere, it's a different story, and there's all sorts of good intellectual academic work that needs to be done there, but I'm talking about it in the public sphere. I mean, in the political sphere, it's a very difficult uh, issue to tackle without a hell of a lot of backup in the, in the political sphere. Assuming, I think, for a moment, the question is about constitutional protection of property rights. This is a very, uh, we have, um, again, on my stricture, I won't talk about what I was up to in uh, government, but maybe I can draw on some lessons from what I was in government. The path to the constitutional amendment that protects property rights in the Constitution is an issue that requires a great deal more <coughs> legal and parliamentary thinking. Uh, it will almost certainly require a private member's bill to do it, rather than government legislation to do it, for reasons that I won't go into, but people can go do the research themselves, it's all publicly available. Uh, and it would almost certainly require private members' legislation at the federal level and at a number of provinces' level. Uh, I think uh, Scott uh, Reed uh, and um, uh, uh, his uh, provincial friend here in Ontario, uh, Randy Hillier, thank you, are on the right uh, uh, tactical path here. I don't, I, I haven't followed their strategic argument for property rights protection, but I, I think I understand the tactical considerations that they're playing here and broadening out uh, Scott and Randy's uh, efforts here is, is, I think it's the practical path forward here. But we need to do, a, if, in addition to making the principal case and then the concrete case that uh, Andrew's been talking about, we need the, the legislative legal path here. And that is a great deal more complicated than it appears to be on first, first glance. We need, this is probably a, a good five or 10 years worth of pretty thankless, parliamentary and legal research before we can push this forward again? Uh, I think that short form means uh, in your grandchildren's time, maybe. <laughs> and the uh, questioner looked to me to be about 25. No, so. My kids are adults. <laughs> <laughs> and the time has come to say thank you for attending and very, very specifically thank you to the panel for the information and the entertainment. Bless your hearts. Thank you very much. <laughs>